Hey there! You know, it's been a while since we looked at some gateway systems. And we've got two charming desktops from the late 90s or early 2000s here. Those should be fun to explore, so let's tear into these. Starting with the E3400. You know, I'm continually impressed with how well gateways resist yellowing. Who would have ever guessed gateway used such high quality plastic? And we see this system was well into the CalPrint logo era. And that is no ordinary floppy drive. That little insignia on the door indicates that this is an LS120 super drive. LS120s were called super floppies, and they could hold 120 megabytes of data. And these drives are actually fully backwards compatible with regular 3.5 inch floppy disks. And this is in fact my very first LS120 drive. Back in the day, zip disks served my large capacity disk needs. And nothing too noteworthy about that generic looking CD-ROM drive. Although it does look original. And we're badged for Windows 2000. And we're sporting a Pentium 3. Though interestingly enough, it has a COA sticker for Windows 98. What's up with that? I would think it would also be badged for Windows 98. My first thought was somebody swapped this top cover. But that serial number matches the serial number on the back. And speaking of the back, here it is. Conspicuously absent is a dial-up modem. That's surprising. But we do have an RJ45 NIC. We also have onboard sound and USB. And I find it very interesting that we have two VGA ports. I'm guessing this upper one is a card. Well, that's quite odd to give you this little window here. I can see that being quite tricky with modern VGA connectors. And here's a good look at that label. Manufactured September 2nd, 2000. All right, let's get this thing open. We seem to have a single thumb screw here. And it stays with the case, quite conveniently. Now I'm guessing we do a slidey thing? No, it doesn't slide. It may have something to do with these tabs. Let's see, they spread outward. Do we lift up, maybe? Yep, looks like it. There we go. Whoa, that is weird. This thing is quite strange. The ATX power connector is on the riser. And surprisingly, it does have AGP graphics. But this card is quite unique. Look at that weird I.O. shield. It's square. So there definitely wouldn't be any swapping in of a regular video card. Unless you wanted to just be flopping around in there. Let's pull that card out. And it is an ATI Rage 128. But I just can't get over that I.O. shield. Look how funny that looks. I suppose if you found a video card that had the VGA connector in that exact same spot, you could just swap this over. But I'm not aware of any standard positioning of the VGA socket. That's interesting. And there's the backside. So it otherwise just looks like a regular Rage 128 from 1999. Strange stuff. Uh oh, we've got capacitor plague issues. This thing is right in that time period. Looks like the bad ones are a 1500 microfarad, which I don't have. And funny enough, I just ordered some. But I highly doubt they're going to be here in time. Hopefully there's still just enough life left in these things to run this machine. And lucky enough we have a hard drive with an 80 conductor cable. But what is this contrivance they have it mounted in? PaloAltoProducts.com This thing looks like it has some tricks up its sleeve. Let's see what it does. Let's get this thing disconnected. Now I guess you just lift up on this. Okay. Hey, that's really easy. Quantum Fireball. 7.5 gigabytes. Looks like a manufactured date of August 31st, 2000. So probably original to the system. I'm not quite sure what gateway I like to use for hard drives in this time period. But it seems legit. And I'm seeing some ever so subtle signs of water damage in this system. That video card IO shield had some of this oxidation too. We're gonna have to keep an eye out for that. And I see we have a case intrusion detection switch on that riser. That just lets you know whenever somebody opens the case. But it's the type of thing I only ever really see on enterprise grade machines. Perhaps this was Gateway's business oriented machine? I'm not sure Gateway ever targeted the enterprise, but I guess they must have. Okay, let's check out the brains of the operation, starting with the RAM. Yeah, and that's a 512 meg stick of PC133 from Crucial, which is a Micron company. So I'm not convinced this is original to the system. I'm pretty sure Crucial is a consumer only division. Well, let's see what's going on with that CPU. Let's get that fan disconnected. Ah, that heatsink clip definitely is not finger friendly. Okay, how did they expect you to do this? Yeesh. I don't know anybody with a pain tolerance that high. Oh, that's fun. But hey, it's off. 
and not doing well in the thermal compound department. That's quite sad. And that's a 733 MHz chip with 256K of cache and 133 MHz frontside bus. And if I'm reading the FPO code correctly, it was manufactured the 36th week of the year 2000. So no doubt original to the system. Let's get the remnants of that thermal compound off of there. Now let's just check those pins. And yep, they're pins. All good. Let's just leave this in there for now. Okay, I want to get this motherboard out of here, just because I can. And it looks like this panel down here is some kind of contraption what for allowing the motherboard to slide out, after removing these four screws, of course. So let's see how that goes. And there's that paloaltoproducts.com URL again, which I did check, and that site no longer exists. It's being domain parked. So I guess that was Gateway's case OEM. And look at that, we've got destructions. According to those, we just lift up on these tabs while somehow flipping this out. And there we go. Hey, that was pretty easy. I wonder why they ever went out of business. And this tab says lift then pull. So let's do that. Okay, I guess that released something. What do we pull? That doesn't seem like it should be pulling. Let's just try pulling on the board. Not getting far, but the thing has a gigantic edge connector over there. It's basically the size of the entire motherboard. Okay, I must be missing something. Let's try pulling this all the way out. Aha, there we go. I just had to overcome the firm grip of that edge connector. Look at the size of that thing. Interesting bit of modularity in this case. See, we can position these little nut bars in just about any configuration. I'm just gonna put this one back where it came from. And now it's clear to me I wasn't supposed to remove those screws, but that probably would have resulted in the breakage of this little lever here. So I'm still glad I did it the way I did. And it's a good thing there weren't any SMD components in the path of that nut bar as it would have knocked them clean off. And is that solder residue? It sure looks like it, in various parts of the board. Yeah, sure is. Well, that's one hell of a manufacturing flaw. This stuff is kind of everywhere. There's some up here, too. Let me see if I can clean that off. Let's see what can be done without the desoldering wick. Okay, at least it comes right off the solder mask. Okay, that's good enough, I guess. It probably wasn't hurting anything to begin with, but it was still bothering me. And here's some more. That's pretty crazy. This board would have most likely been wave soldered, and the solder mask is supposed to prevent the solder from sticking to things it's not supposed to stick to. That is interesting. I wonder who Gateway's motherboard OEM was. Okay, I do see some signs of corrosion here. Fortunately, it doesn't look too major. Let's just try to scrub it off with IPA. Okay, yeah, no harm done. And luckily, I don't see any other problems with this board. So let's start knocking this dust off. Now, let's check out that battery. Yeah, I'd say it's dead. Just slightly. I swear this channel is the best thing that ever happened to the CR2032 industry. Okay, let's see how that fan's sounding. Well, despite some vibration, actually sounds great. No bearing service needed. Let's just get everything cleaned up. Good enough for me. Okay, now, let's make sense of that thermal whatnot. Almost came off clean. I believe that will do. A spoonful of slurry will cure what ails ya. My thumb will never forgive me. Yeesh. They couldn't possibly make that more uncomfortable. Okay, now, what does it take to get these drives out of here? I'm about 80% certain this faceplate has to come off. And I see some clips. That should be easy enough. 
Let's see. Yeah, yep, super easy. It's always a win when those don't break. I suppose I should disconnect that drive, yeah? Make sure I got things packed up in here. Well, that was tricky. And these drives are on rails. So we just squeeze these two together. And it breaks immediately. Well, that's old plastic for you. Well, let's hope the super drive comes out with no incident. Yeah, no trouble at all. And below that we have another three and a half inch drive bay. And they even give you the rails for it. That's so thoughtful. We just don't deserve some people. That's an interesting little arrangement they have for the drive interfaces on this system. They come off the riser. And they're all crammed up here, so let's get this cleared out. And we've got a loose sticker from something. NS Tech. Doesn't ring a bell. Let's go ahead and yank this power supply. Okay, the riser is married to the power supply. I see two screws down here. Aha! And I suppose we're pulling this riser too. However that works. Let's get that front panel connector disconnected. Okay, that wasn't too bad. Interesting little thing on its own it is. I see it contains the Ethernet controller. Well, they were certainly trying to make the most of the available space in this case. And there be our CD-ROM drive, made by Mitsumi, in July 2000. It's not immediately clear whether or not this is a gateway part, but the manufacture date seems to line up. Let's wipe that off. Now let's see if I can't get this rail off in one piece. There we go. And good thing I already broke this one. And here's the super drive. This one is most definitely a gateway original part. And it was also manufactured in July 2000 by Matsushita. Let's wipe it off. And get rid of those rails. Now, I actually have no idea how to service one of these drives. I mostly just took it apart out of curiosity and to make sure it's not excessively dusty, which luckily it's not. That makes me feel better about putting a disc in there. And it's really hard to get a shot of those heads, but they sure are funny looking at least compared to floppy drive heads, so I am not going to risk trying to clean them. And similar to the voice coil on hard drives, those heads are actuated electromagnetically. See that coil is floating there inside that little contraption, which also has a neodymium magnet, and there's one on each side, though not symmetrical. It's all new and strange to me, and the underside of this thing is just alien. And it's kind of messing with my head because the rest of it looks just like a floppy drive. And also, this eject button is a switch. Sounds like it's hitting a normally open momentary push button. Kind of like a zip drive. I think I need to go lay down. But who has time to rest when there's a power supply to torture? And this is a very weird, unique, and non-standard one. So I really don't want it to blow up. Therefore, what I'm going to do is open it up. That way, if something does explode, I can see what. Okay, at first glance, we look pretty good in here. I don't see any dying capacitors. I see good quality Celastic. That's the silicone-y stuff they put here to stop things from moving around. Okay, let's test it then. And power time! Now that doesn't sound good. That is definitely that fan. I'm definitely gonna have to look at that. But otherwise, everything else seems good. Let's see, is that the fan? Yep, sure is. Okay, that's no big deal. But I can't listen to that for five minutes, so let's go ahead and fix it. Look at that. Doesn't even want a free spin. Let's go ahead and cut into that label. That gives us bearing access. I'm actually going to flush this bearing since it sounded so terrible. Let's get some IPA down there. Let's go ahead and work it in. Now I'll try to pull it out with a swab. Yeah, pretty dirty. Now let's go ahead and let it air dry. 
Now I'll drip some oil down there. Just a couple of drops will do. Now let's run it till it sounds okay. Man, it's already sounding a lot better. Even in the direction that it's normally mounted in. Okay, that'll do. Let's get that label clean. That way our tape will actually stick to it. And then we'll seal it up with our good friend Captain Tape. Now let's trim that up, why not? There, that's a lot better. Can't be interfering with the solid melody of the sacrificial hard drives. That's not allowed. And we have made it. Five minutes in, good power supply. And this case is so dusty I can't even stand it. So let's go ahead and strip it down so I can blast it out. Eh, fair enough. Okay, now that I'm pre-asthmatic, this thing's clean. Let's get it back together. Okay, I want to get the full nut bar experience. So I've gone ahead and reattached those to the motherboard. So let's reinstall this thing the way it was meant to be done. Let's just line up the one I can see. Okay, I gotta get a little pushy. Well, what do you know, it works. I did have to push uncomfortably hard on this lever though. And it's not all the way in there either, I don't think. Let's try pulling it back out. Okay, well that's actually easier. But I did add some deoxid to that riser there, and that adds a degree of lubricity. Okay, let's get this thing in there seated properly. I guess that's it. I swear I don't remember that thing sticking out. Okay, I got it to settle down. I just had to give an extra firm shove on the motherboard to seat that edge connector the rest of the way. The system is woefully proprietary, so one must be careful. Okay, it is whole again. Well, mostly. Let's see how far we can get with six pad capacitors. Okay, it didn't wait for me to push the power button. Rude. All right, we're posting. Beep, beep. CMOS settings are wrong, obviously. We don't care. Okay, what's it doing? Okay, just continue. Looks like we're booting something. Something NT-based. Yeah, now we just have a black screen. I do have disk activity. This might be capture device shenanigans. Okay, I ruled out the capture device. That is innocent this time. It seems to crash as soon as the OS loads. And another interesting symptom, the CPU fan stops spinning. Let's see, watch when I go ahead and try to load Windows. Yeah, there it goes. It stopped spinning. Another thing that's weird is I can hear the reset button. It's coming out as noise from the PC speaker. Let me go ahead and hold the microphone up close to that. Isn't that just the weirdest thing? But that begs the question, does this happen even on a non-Windows OS? So let's find out. Well, at least the CD-ROM drive opened right up. Let's see if we get that same behavior in Canopics. Okay, made it to the boot screen. Let's see. And yep, exact same behavior. Okay, so we definitely have hardware problems. And that's kind of no surprise given the condition of those caps. Bad caps can cause all kinds of weird behavior. And as luck would have it, we have caps. The mailman arrived just in time to save the video. Let's go ahead and get this board recapped. And I gotta say, the serviceability of this system is really starting to grow on me. All I had to do is pull that video card. The motherboard should just come right out. Just like that. Okay, I got our target caps marked. I should be able to get them to just fall off the board with the desoldering alloy. My favorite party trick. Let's hit them with some flux. Now, let's see. Yep, there it goes. That's one down. And that's two down. 
I don't know why I enjoy that so much. And that's three down. And that one made it all the way to the floor. Okay, now let's clean all this up. And let's get rid of that flux. Okay, that's clean enough for now. Well, you know, at least they didn't explode and corrode. I'll give them that. Okay, let's clean up top side. All right, let's get those caps in there and solder them down, starting with flux, of course. Let's go over those once more. Good enough for me. Let's clean it up. Done and done. Now, time to find out if that was all in vain. Let's find out. Oh, hey, it still turns on. Okay, here we are at the crash point. Let's see. And yes, it's booting. Windows XP. <laughs> that feeling never gets old. Fixing stuff, that is. All right, we acquired a new bad capacitor symptom and a very odd one. Ooh, we got the classic NT logon, control alt delete thing. I wonder if this was from an enterprise environment. Control alt delete. And we got a password probably. That's okay, we can crack that. Let's see, maybe they left it blank. Nope, okay, no problem. We can reset that. Let's get back into Canopics. Let's see if it'll run 9.1. Let's give it a clean shutdown. Or we'll restart in this case. Ooh, it looks like it wants to. Let's see. Well, it is booting, but it sounds like that CD-ROM drive's having some trouble. Okay, weird clicking sound once it finally spins up. It is doing it though. It is taking its sweet time to load the desktop environment though. Fortunately, we don't need it. Let's see if we can break out to a terminal. Yeah, there we go. Okay, let's make sure we see that hard drive. Okay, it's gotta be SDA1. Let's go ahead and mount that. Let's see, where was that even mounted at? Media slash SDA1. Let's make sure. Yep, that's a Windows install. Put in that Windows directory and get at that SAM hive. System32 not capitalized. There we go. And there it is. The SAM hive is where Windows NT stores its local account information, including passwords. Okay, now we just use the chntpw tool on that SAM hive. Get rid of that password. All right, let's go ahead and clear that admin password. Let's make sure it's unlocked. That should do it for the administrator account. Couldn't write that out. But I didn't see that one user account. This thing might have been domain joined. I don't get much of a scroll back buffer. And by the way, to scroll on the console, just shift page up or shift page down. Huh, that's strange. Should be able to edit that one user. Back to user select. Yeah, it just kicks me out. Okay, that's weird. Well, either way, at least we can get into the local admin account now. Let's give it a clean reboot. So that everything unmounts cleanly. Hey, the sound card works. Yeah, that JDE is the account I wanted to get into. But for right now, let's just go to local administrator. Let me in. I don't care about that right now. And we are in. But I can't believe they disabled the Windows startup sound. Such killjoys. Okay, now let's see about those local accounts. Hey, we got updates available. Okay, whatever that is. Hey, this got my user manager snap in. I love Windows NT. Yeah, JDE was indeed a local account. Let's just go ahead and reset that password. Proceed. Let's give our super secure password. That's totally not just password. All right, that's done. Yeah, this was definitely some kind of business environment. Now let's try to get into that account now. JDE. 
Yes, I'm sure. Yes, we know. All right. Got some NASA paraphernalia there. I like this person already. What's this PLD reminder thing? Apparently it's UPS related. Okay. Go away. All right. At long last, we are in. Let's see what we have on here. Oh, this guy definitely was doing some productive stuff. <laughs> what do we have? Just some graphic stuff, some office productivity stuff. Looks pretty boring. What do we have in that games folder? All the usual suspects. <laughs> Bellark Advisor. Let's see what that has to say for itself. And <laughs> that is taking its sweet time. I might just give up on that. Yeah, I think it's time to kill old Bellark Advisor. Nobody has time for that. Oh, go figure. When I'm about to kill it, it starts doing stuff. Checking the security settings of this computer. You're going to be sorely disappointed. Man, I'm running out of disk space. It's part of the reason why this thing's running so terribly. That combined with the fact that it's a Pentium 3 running Windows XP. Let's see, what does all Bellark Advisor have for us? It is Windows XP Service Pack 2. Okay, nothing groundbreaking there. Oh, cool, we got some dates. Was this thing being used all the way up to 2010? If so, that would be an incredibly long life for this machine. I don't know where else this would get those dates. Would have had to pull them from somewhere. Somewhere in internet land. Well, luckily, this being Windows NT, we can get some idea of the last time it was used. Event log usually gives us a clue. Let's embiggen that. System 2011? Okay, first let's figure out what date it thinks it is. Okay, it thinks it's 1990, so yeah, those are valid date stamps. This thing was being used all the way up to 2011, and it is in remarkably good condition for being used that long, so I can easily forgive that bad power supply fan. <laughs> That's incredible. And also kind of scary that they were running Service Pack 2 all that time. Okay, what else do we have? Let's see what version of Word that is. Office XP. In the post-Clippy era. Okay, what else can we get into? It's kind of funny that they had Coral Draw on a system that was named Shipping. That's very odd. wonder why that is. Let's see if we can get one of those to open. I don't know enough about Coral Draw to tell the difference between X3 and 9. We'll go with X3. Sounds cooler. <laughs> That's cool. It's a chameleon. Okay, well it opens. And I don't know the first thing of what to do in here, so let's just get out. Well, let's see what's on the root of the hard drive, why not? These files are hidden. Guess they didn't go into their C drive very often. Just a bunch of boring office stuff. Let's see, it was complaining about low disk space. Let's see how low it was. <laughs> Incredibly low. 198 megabytes left. Where is it getting a B drive from? Does that LS120 drive emulate two drives? Well, you know what? I think it's about time we tested that thing anyway. And this will be my first ever interaction with an LS120 drive. Ooh, that felt weird. It just kind of took the disc. Didn't snap in like a regular floppy drive. Okay, is it A drive or B drive? Let's we'll start with A. And it's doing stuff. And it works! <laughs> that thing sounds so funny, too. I don't think the microphone picked it up. And of course, I don't have any LS120 discs. I've never even seen one in person. That would have been nice to test. Okay, let's see what B drive was all about. Okay, I guess it's just a phantom spooky ghost drive. They probably got enabled in the BIOS somewhere. Okay, go away. Quit. Oh, that is no reason to crash, Explorer. There we go. I want to hear that super drive again. <laughs> that sounds so funny. Let's copy all this stuff off of here. That sounds nothing like a floppy drive. I'm gonna put the microphone up close. It sounds more like a hard drive. And that copied fast too. I know LS120 drives are like super speed floppy drives. Now, do I get my disc back? 
Oh, I sure do. <laughs> that thing's cool. Okay, now, with this being an NTFS drive, I'm not going to be able to run ScanDisk. At least, not my preferred DOS version of ScanDisk. So we're going to have to run the not-so-aesthetically-pleasing Windows version. Error checking. How boring. Let's go ahead and check out that drive. And do it all. It's probably going to ask to reboot. Yep, no problem. Go right ahead. And now, we wait. And looks like we're good. Incredible. Okay, now, time for a well-deserved cleaning. It doesn't need much. There's just a few little scuffs here and there. But now it looks even better. I am gonna have to replace that Intel badge, though. Good thing Geekenspiel exists. And same deal for the top of the machine. Okay, not too bad. We do have some plastic damage up here, but what are you gonna do? The thing was e-waste. Wow, what a machine. A little capacitor plague couldn't keep this thing down. Not on my watch. And considering that and the power supply fan were the only things that were wrong, I am thoroughly impressed. Especially considering this thing's 11 year service life. Who knew you could get such quality from Gateway? And that capacitor plague thing is hardly a knock against this thing. That affected many, many other brands. Well, maybe it's ready for another 11 years. Let's move on to the next system. Next system is the P5166, and this system is actually older than the previous one. That's pretty funny because I think it looks newer. But the original Gateway 2000 emblem is a dead giveaway, as well as the Pentium 1 badge. And that CD and floppy drive look awfully unique. Hopefully they're not too special, and if so, hopefully they work. And this system actually has an additional drive bay. You just push this little button up here, and there it is. They even went through the trouble of putting a little damper on that door for silky smooth operation. I just love stuff like that. And here's the back of the machine. Now that is quite a sight. Onboard USB on a Pentium 1 system. They were definitely thinking ahead. And we have some kind of sound card there. And it could be a nice one. Gateway 2000 systems tend to have really decent sound cards, at least in my experience. And I guess somebody had a numeric system for determining where things go. And that's one way to do it. And here's a close look at that label. Manufactured July 16th, 1997. Alright, let's get this thing open. We just have two thumb screws here. I'm guessing they're not captive. Now, surely this just slides back. Nothing to it. And look at the size of that VRM heatsink. It's almost as big as the CPU's heatsink. And somebody got the hard drive. Big sad. Oh well. What is that in there? Oh, <laughs> there's sticky notes. I wonder how that got in there. Judging by the dust, it's been there for a while. <laughs> That's funny. Let's start clearing these cables out. Don't know why that sound card is loose, but hey, saved me some work. And that's an Insonic ES1370. I'm honestly not sure about that one. Could be decent enough. It's definitely original to the system, because there's that assembly date. And that modem is also loose. I'm saving some miles on that screwdriver. This is also a Gateway original part, made by US Robotics. One day, I will find a use for all these old dial-up modems. I'm kind of surprised that power supply fan is the only cooling this system has. They didn't add more than they needed, I guess. Okay, let's see what we have for brains. And as advertised, an Intel Pentium 1. And that thermal pad doesn't look too bad. I will of course be refreshing it though. Now let's check the pins. Now for a ZIF socket, that thing's pretty stuck in there. That's very strange. Huh. Well, at least they're all in good condition. And there's our info. Stepping SY037. Let's get that back in there. That is a surprising amount of resistance 
for a ZIF socket. Aha, there is a slightly bent pin. Let's just go ahead and bend that back. Aha, that's a lot better. I wonder how that got bent. It may have been bent from the factory. Okay, how about the RAM? Okay, not immediately clear what size it is, or what speed it is. At least it's clean. And let's just stop and appreciate the fact that this thing has three ISA slots. This could actually make quite a decent little DOS gaming PC. And the onboard graphics is no slouch. An ATI 3D Rage 2 with DVD decoding. So I wonder if that's a DVD drive in there. For 1997, that would have been quite fancy. Okay, let's make sure that battery's dead. Yep, sure is. Wouldn't want to needlessly replace one now. And no CPU fan? Hardly any dust? I feel like I'm playing on easy mode. But we do have to get rid of that thermal compound. A patron of mine sent me this stuff. These are wipes specifically for removing thermal compound. Thank you very much, Sergeant Mac. Let's see how well it works. And man, you weren't lying about this stuff being pungent. It smells almost like tea tree oil. It is taking it off. This is some of the toughest thermal compound that I usually have to deal with. Well, it definitely works as advertised. And that stuff smells too much like tea tree oil. That has me suspicious. I'm gonna have to see if I can make some of these. And I'm just gonna give it a quick wipe with IPA. Since it did leave a little film, thus furthering my oil suspicions. Now that little film left behind is basically just a stain, and sometimes I can finish that off with a melamine sponge, also known as a magic eraser. So let's try that. Yeah, that definitely helped. Our heat sink cleaning technology has come such a long way. Okay, I got the CPU cleaned up too. Let's get it dressed. Dressed for success. Okay, let's work on getting these drives out of here. And I guess the faceplate has to come off too, just like the previous system. So let's see how that goes. Okay, apparently that pops off. At least it didn't break. We are hanging up on something. Ah, there's a little clip in there. And no breakage, just the way I like it. Man, those are some funny looking drives. And they appear to share a drive cage, so I guess we're pulling both at once. Couldn't be simpler. And here's that CD drive. It's not a DVD drive, so I guess that GPU is just really forward thinking. And this thing is made by Toshiba in May 1997. And with that funky-fied faceplate, it's definitely original to the system. So they just attached some kind of something to the disk tray and elongated that LED. So yeah, good luck replacing this drive if you don't already have those pieces. And nothing super about this drive, just your run-of-the-mill Panasonic drive with the keyboard mash model number. And the front of that is also unique, of course. They just have a special door and a thing longer on the eject button, also not replacement friendly. And keeping with the theme of the rest of the system, this drive's incredibly clean inside. That's not going to stop me from cleaning the heads, though. I trust no one. And of course, they were super clean. But now I know they're super clean. Now let's refresh that grease. Okay, now it's the power supply's turn. And this one's quite an odd form factor, too. If it is a standard, it's one that I'm not aware of. But surprisingly enough, I found a listing for this exact model power supply brand new on Amazon. It says there's only three of them left. So if it blows up, I won't be terribly heartbroken. So let's see if it blows up. Let's do the thing. All right, it's working. Well, I'm not getting my five volt load. Bad connection. All right, that's five minutes. I deem you trustworthy. All right, it is that time. Time to see what, if anything, it does. Let's give it something to boot from. Here we go. 
And this one didn't wait for the power button either. Why are gateways so rude? And we have a blinking power LED and no post. That's awfully ominous. Time to investigate, I guess. And no codes on the post analyzer card. Well, that's not great. That could mean the CPU isn't running code, but at least all the voltages are good. Well, I just found something quite strange. I pulled the CPU and that same pin that I straightened was bent again. So I straightened it once more and ran it through the socket. And to my surprise, it was bent again. So there's something wrong with that socket. In fact, if you watch very carefully, this pin here has no wiper when I close the socket. So yeah, something's definitely off in there. So do we replace the CPU socket? Okay, I decided to just go ahead and remove the upper part of that socket. I figured what have I got to lose? And that was definitely tricky to remove. I didn't get any of it on camera because I was just in one of those modes. Got a little overzealous. But we can clearly see a problem with that pin. I'm gonna go ahead and try to straighten it out with a sewing needle. And I'm gonna have to do it off camera because I gotta get all up in there. That thing is tiny. Well, that didn't go well. In the process of unbending that pin contactor, it just broke. I guess from metal fatigue. And I have no replacement for that socket. I doubt you could even still buy replacement socket 7s. So that's the end of the line for this system, at least for now. Well, I suppose I should get my disc out of there. I guess this is the counterbalance to resurrecting the last system. Sure hate to put it on the shelf, but I really can't do anything else with it this week, because I am also out of time. So I'm just gonna keep watch for some new old stock socket 7 sockets. Never know, one could pop up. So this machine is just gonna have to sit in limbo until such time. Well, that was a roller coaster. I will find a NOS socket 7. Though I'm not completely sure if that'll do it because I'm pretty sure that's a VSS pin. Those have a lot of redundancy on CPUs. Sadly, I can't explore any further this week if there's any hope of getting this video out on time. This is my on-call week at work, so I'm particularly pressed. And this channel is made possible by the fine people on Patreon. They help me acquire the hardware to show here, in addition to being generally awesome. Thank you all. See you next time.